The basic laws of health. Incorporate those eight laws. They sound simple. They sound simple. You may have heard it your whole life, but I tell you, those eight laws will make the difference of whether you live long or you live short. The things that you can grow in your garden, that you can put in your kitchen, that's where your medicine cabinet should be. Welcome back to Old Mountain Remedies. In this session, we're gonna look at how to treat stress and anxiety naturally. Anybody have stress? But let's first start with prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us natural remedies that we can address many issues, but stress and anxiety, something that is overwhelming folks around the world. As we look at these natural remedies, we look at the causes and we look at, the, at how to address it. Lord, give us wisdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, stress is the number one diagnosis in America today. Did you know that? It's amazing, as I work with people, diseases such as hypertension, that's not the primary diagnosis, it's secondary to the primary diagnosis, stress. Cancer, I believe a major cause of cancer today, a major cause, if not the most cause, is stress. Let's take a look. We're first going to take a look and we're going to look at the effects on the body. What are the effects of stress and anxiety on the body? Then we're going to take a look at how to address it naturally, how to treat it. The relationship which exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health of the physical system. If the mind is free and happy from a consciousness of right doing and a sense of satisfaction in causing happiness to others, it creates a cheerfulness that will react upon the whole system, causing a freer circulation of the blood and a toning up of the entire body. It's very interesting. It says a freer circulation. As we look at what's important in the body, the key to health is the quality of the blood and the circulation of the blood. Very critical as you look at cause and effect. A great deal of sickness which afflicts humanity has its origin in the mind and can only be cured by res restoring the mind to health. There are very many more th than we imagine who are sick mentally. Heart sickness makes many dyspeptics, for mental trouble has a paralyzing influence upon digestive orders. Have you ever found that? Have you ever found that when you're stressed, it affects your digestive system? We're learning more and more today as, as there's more and more study. Scientifically, there's a relationship which exists between the mind and the stomach, and between the stomach and the mind. The mind controls the whole man. All our actions, good or bad, have their source in the mind. It is a mind that worships God and allies us to heavenly beings. Yet many spend all their lives without becoming intelligent regarding to the casket, jewel casket, that contains this treasure. And this is the major thing. As we look at the mind, what's really, really important, that is what we have our connection between ourselves and God. Nine-tenths of the disease from which men suffer have their foundation in the mind. That doesn't mean we're crazy or, or we're mental. It just means that as we look at stress, anxiety, it starts here. And if the number one diagnosis in America is stress, do we all have mind problems? If we're stressed, absolutely, because the problem's origin is in the mind. As I work with people who have stress, I tell them we're dealing with a brain issue. We've got to fix the brain. As I work with people who have anxiety, 
I tell them, we've got a brain issue here. We've got to work with the brain. As we pull out all the stops to figure out what's going on with that brain, to, to provide it the resources that makes that brain work more efficiently, we see anxiety, we see stress, we see depression, we see bipolar starting to correct. And that's what we're going to look at today. What is stress? Stress is the body's response to a real or perceived threat or stressors. It does not even have to be real, but if you perceive it as real, then it's stress. Have you ever been going down the road? You're going down the road, you're late. As you're driving down the road, all of a sudden you see somebody pull out and he whips in behind you. You ever have that feeling? And here he comes right up on you. Oh no. And then he whizzes past you. He's after someone else. Was he after you? No. But did you perceive he could be because you were going a little over the speed limit? Absolutely. Stress is our body's internal alarm system. It's our body's internal alarm system that something's going on. Stress prepares the body to take action. See, if we didn't have stress, then we'd just be, everything's cool, everything's fine. But stress says there's a problem here. We've got to get ready for something called fight or flight. And we'll talk about that. There's three types of stress. There is acute stress, episodic acute, and chronic stress. What are they? Let's look. What is acute stress? Imminent onset, which forces the body to an immediate reaction. That could be a, a minor traffic accident, an argument, or impending deadline. Are, do you ever have those deadlines, and I've got to get this done now, now, and oh, you're just so stressed. That is acute stress. In healthcare, we have acute care facilities. That would be your hospital. That's immediate, imminent issues. Episodic acute stress, acute stress which occurs frequently, escalating demands for personal time and attention, careless worry, worry or anxiety. Or what about a type A personality? Do you know any of those folks? Type A behavior characterized by a competitive drive, aggressiveness, impatience, or urgency. Have you ever got a phone call from someone and you know this person and they need it done now or no, they need it done a minute ago and it's really not an acute situation. It's really not an emergency, but that's just their personality. They want it done out of there and then they can work on something else and they put you in the hot seat. That's that acute or episodic acute stress, chronic stress, long-term stress, unrelenting job, Family pressures over and over and over, sleep deprivation, strain roles and responsibilities at work or home, chronic, long term. It has been estimated that 75 to 90 percent of all visits to primary care physicians are for stress related problems. Job stress is far and away the leading source of stress for adults. But stress levels have also escalated in children, teenagers, college students, and the elderly for other reasons, including increased crime, violence, other threats to personal safety, pernicious peer pressure that leads to substance abuse and other unhealthy lifestyle habits, social isolation, loneliness, the erosion of family and religious values and ties, the loss of other strong sources of social support that are powerful stress busters. Are you seeing an erosion of family? We are. Are we seeing erosion of religious issues? As I go across the United States and speak, I go to some communities and there's not much religion there. My daughter was working in Loveland, Colorado, and she would go house to house as a Bible worker. 
And she could go almost all day long and not find a person who was a Christian. They didn't believe in God. No, I don't believe in God. And finally she might find one. And where she grew up in the Bible Belt in the South, every door almost believed in God. We are all subject to stressors. The amount of stress we experience depends on how we respond on it. Let's take a look. You've got a stressor. It might be financial, work, relationships, health, traffic, or pollution. But what's your response? Well, to have a response, it has to go through what? Through the brain. And when it goes through the brain, the, de the brain determines your reaction. Is it going to be verbal? Is it going to be physical? Is it going to be mental? Someone cuts you off. How are you going to handle it? Are you just going to keep driving? Or are you going to go into road rage? I can remember the first house fire that I went into that it flashed over. I was a rookie. I just started firefighting and I was following in as the third guy. It was a two story house in Udawal. We pull up with the fire truck. There's fire upstairs in the second story on both sides and both the B side and the D side. A line is pulled. We go up the they go up the staircase. I'm following third guy up. We get up into the top of the staircase. We have fire in both rooms. The doors are open. It's an inferno up there. And, and all of a sudden, over the hallway where we were, it was flame about from here to the ceiling. It scared me to death. I left them. I took off down that staircase as fast as I could, got outside, took my air pack out, off. I was hyperventilating. It scared me to death. Now, do I do that today? No, because I've gotten used to it. I go up there and you'll sit there in that and you'll cool it down and we're okay. We'll put those rooms out. It's experience. That school teacher, that first year on the job, she gets there and, and boy, it's tough. Or that parent, the first child they have, it falls down, oh no. Or it has this, oh no. The second child, it's not as bad. The third child, oh well, it'll be okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? As that stressor goes through the brain, experience, how you've dealt with it, your relationship with God, as you've changed those, you've got, as we deal with things, it goes across a synapse. And as we change and go to a different way of dealing things, we even go over here. And so we change and put more boutons on this one. And so we deal with it now this way. As it goes over to here and someone makes us mad, we don't cuss like the sailor, like we may have used to, because we've put more boutons on this one where we don't cuss. So it's important that we realize a foundation of stress and anxiety is the health of the brain and, that, and how our brain deals with that stressor. Dr. Walter Cannon's classic study, Cat Confronted by the Dog. He took a cat that hated dogs and he took its vital signs. And then he stuck the cat down and a dog that hated cats. And as he let them go, they took off and he let the cat run. And then he snatched up the cat and he took its vitals. What did he find? He found the heart rate went up, the respirations went up, the sugar in the blood went up, the clotting mechanism went up, the muscle function went up, but the digestion process shut down. It's called fight. Or flat. The human reaction to stress, increase heart rate. These are the physiological changes. Your heart rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. Your respirations go up. Hormones and adrenaline go up. Blood sugar can go up. The blood clotting mechanism, the bears chasing you. So it could be an injury. So it's a, a clotting issue. Have you ever wondered why a person with stress is more prone to a stroke? Well, he's, he, he, he's more clotted. The increased muscle function, queasy stomach, nervous perspiration, headaches, sporadic eating, increased hunger, less appetite, depending on what the person, their personality, changes in sleep habit. But here's what happens. All those others go up, but these two change. 
It shuts down the digestive system or reduces it significantly. And Harvard University found that it shuts down your healing process. Your immune system drops. Your healing process shuts down. Did you know, when a lady goes to the doctor and they do a mammogram and they say, ooh, I think we may have something here. We need to do a biopsy uh, and, and uh, we're going to send that off to the path lab. They do the biopsy. They send it to the path lab. They found that Harvard found that when they, that lady waits, they actually took samples of her saliva four times a day, and they found her cortisol level just shot through the roof because she had uncertainty whether she had breast cancer. And then when they, they came back five days later, two weeks later, whatever it came back, they came back and says, Mrs. So-and-so, I believe we have cancer, but here's our plan. Even though she, she, she does have cancer, but because the uncertainty is gone, she knows she has it, there's a plan, cortisol drops. So it's a reason that we need to have those results come back a lot sooner because the healing factor totally sh almost shut down according to Harvard University. And she needs it then. She's got cancer. Under stress, the body releases cortisol and adrenaline, which raises the blood pressure and prepares the body to do battle. When physical action is taken, the body uses up the stress hormones in the, in the blood, reducing stress and relaxing the body. Have you ever found when you're stressed that if you go and take a walk or a fast stroll, the stressor comes down? It works. You're lowering the cortisol level. When physical action is not taken, such as when we're sitting at our desk and we're stressed out, stuck in traffic. That's a tough one for me. I don't have any patience for traffic. I'm glad I don't live in New York City. Hurrying to finish our taxes before midnight. You ever been there? <clears throat> the stress hormone and chemicals in our blood remains for long periods of time. If you're stressed all day long, that means all those physiological effects that we just talked about are going on in your body. And you wonder why you're worn out at the end of the day. Stress affects the onset, treatment, or recovery from the following diseases and conditions. <clears throat> Cardiovascular disease, cancer, angina pectoris, diabetes mellitus, or diabetes mellitus, that's type 2 diabetes, tuberculosis, rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, ulcers, AIDS. Now, wait a minute. Well, how do you get AIDS from stress? Well, what happens is, as they start out with HIV, they can more, more quickly go to full-blown AIDS if they have stress. Muscle relation conditions, allergies, common colds, blows the immune system, warts, skin rashes, loss of hair, grain of hair. So where is the real danger? Is it acute stress or is it chronic stress? Chronic stress, unrelieved stress, causes the most damage. Mental effects of an ongoing stressor, mental fatigue, loss of spontaneousness and creativity, confusion. Have you ever been stressed, 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 and someone tries to get you, I'm just so confused, I'm not sure what to do. Forgetfulness. If you have chronic stress, it can cause you to forget things. Difficulty in making decisions. You're pushed, 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 and they want a decision, 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 and you're just, I'm not sure what to do. Anxiety, absolutely. Depression, lowering of self-worth, lower intellectual functioning. Your brain just doesn't work as well. The intellectual functioning diminishes under stress. Boredom, emotional Hypersensitivity. Have you ever found a person that when they're really stressed and you come up and ask them a question, they just blow up and you say, she's having a bad day today. Just leave her alone. That can happen. Feeling of isolation and alienation, tendency towards suppressed feelings, withdrawal, or maybe aggression, or maybe quick temper. 
Have you ever found folks who have a, a lot of stress have a short fuse? Yes. So these are the effects. What about the mental effects of an ongoing stressor? Loss of control. Increased risk-taking behavior. Increased drug use and abuse. We see that a lot. Have you ever heard a person say, I'm glad I don't drink? Did you know just one minute, just one minute of anger suppresses your immune system for six hours? Isn't that amazing? You're on the telephone and you're talking to someone, a rate customer calls in and they blast you and, and you get all angry. You just wiped out your immune system for up to six hours. You're driving down the road and someone cuts you off and boy, you just, whew, you just lowered your immune system for up to six hours. You're in a conversation. <clears throat> just had a situation the other day. Husband goes home for lunch. Wife goes home for lunch. They get into a fight and a very devastating event took place. The anger that just took place. So part one, we looked at the effects of stress on the body. But we probably pretty well all know those things because they've happened to us. But the real question when you're here tonight is, what do I do about it? How can I address my stress effectively? How can I address my anxiety effectively but naturally? Not taking the drugs. Not taking those things that could be harmful to me. So let's take a look at natural treatments for stress and anxiety. This is the first one I look at. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth up or drieth the bones. I was speaking in New York City, just north of New York City, and we'd sing this song, A Merry Heart Doeth Good Like a Medicine, <clears throat> at the beginning of each of the lectures. And a lady stood up, she was a physician from New York City, and she says, I need to tell you something. She says, I'm a physician and I specialize in bone marrow. And when people are happy, there's a chemical that comes out of the bone marrow that, that builds the immune system. She said, but if people are not happy, if they are stressed, anxious, depressed, that chemical does not come out. She said, you are so right. That comes to us from Proverbs verse, chapter 17, Verse 22, disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly aggravated by the imagination. Many are lifelong invalids who might well be, who might be well if they only thought so. I had an aunt that way. Anybody came by that was sick, she'd go up to Mayo and figure out if she had it also. But what about what it talks about there? Disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly uh, uh, aggravated by the imagination. That can happen. Where a person's really not that sick, but they, it's up here. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love promote health and prolong life. Would you like the answer? Would you like to know what to do? Take your pen out and write these down. This is very important. This is guaranteed stuff, 100% guaranteed stuff. If you will have courage, if you will have hope, if you will have faith, remember we talked about trusting God, if you will have sympathy, if you will love, it will promote health, and prolong life. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. It's simple, y'all. Yes, it may be challenging to do that, but you know what it is? It's a dying to self. It's being broken where you are not the important thing. Sometimes that's tough. Gratitude, rejoicing, benevolence, trusting God's love and care, these are health's greatest safeguards. 
The relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than, any, than many realize. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. So mental depression, but look at grief, anxiety, discontent. Are you not happy with your life, your job, where you live, your car, your spouse, whatever it might be? Do you have discontent? Do you have remorse? Do you have guilt? Do you have guilt about something that happened years ago? Something that you did? Something you said? Ask God for forgiveness. Ask that person to forgive you, and that will be taken away. You won't have to have that guilt on your back like a monkey anymore. Distrust. Do you distrust people? All tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death. The question is, can I manage my stress? Because you cannot get rid of stress and be alive. Stress is going to be there. So can I manage my stress? Well, I'd like to share with you a key that I found. It's called controllables and non-controllables. As we look at finances, there's things in your home that are controllable expen uh, expenses and non-controllable expenses. What are some of the controllable ones? Well, let's look at the non-controllable ones first. It might be taxes on your land. Is that a non-controllable? There's not a thing you can do about it unless you move somewhere else. Or maybe you have to uh, drive X far to work every day and there's no option, so you gotta spend so much on the gas. Or maybe it's controllable of what car you have to what that cost of gas is. Yes, we have to have electricity, but are you leaving the lights on? What's the th temperature that you're setting your, your, um, your thermostat at? What kind of food do you eat? Yes, we got to eat food, but do you go out to eat every day? Are you, are you staying in the house, coming home, and, and making food that you bought at the grocery store? You take your own meal. That can control cost. So there's controllables and there's non-controllables. So what are they? I have found there's eight controllables that you can do that will affect stress. The first one is nutrition. The second one's exercise. The third one's water. And we've talked about this already before. Sunshine, temperance, fresh air, and rest. These are controllables that you can either do or not do, and they will have a tremendous impact, impact on the level of stress which you have. Let's look at nutrition first. The increased amount of adrenaline that is suddenly released into the body during stress causes the body to mobilize and quickly utilize important vitamins and nutrients such as amino acids, B vitamins, vitamin C, minerals like magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus. So when you're stressed, you unload these nutrients. It is therefore critical to ensure adequate and constant replenishment of these important nutrients during times of physical, emotional, and psychological stress. So how do we do that? We can, in our food, if you're eating healthy food, sometimes you may need to do it through supplementation, but I first choose food, and we'll look at that. Today, most individuals leave chronically stressed lives. Without a sufficient intake of essential minerals and vitamins through a healthy diet and supplements to compensate for their body's increased need, many are very vulnerable to the damages or damaging physical effects of stress. So we looked at if, we, if when we do have stress, we're going to lose those nutrients. If you don't replace those nutrients, then you're going to really be in a tough time because it takes what you're depleting many times required for you to be able to be ready for that next stressor. Vitamins, vitamin A, B-complex vitamins, huge, this is huge. 
Vitamin C. Vitamin A plays an important role in maintaining immune function. As an antioxidant, it protects immune function by helping to maintain the integrity of epithelial barriers to infections. It also activates phagocytes and cytotoxic T cells. Studies also show that vitamin A confers a protective effect against perioxidation in the heart and brain. And preoxidation is believed to be a risk factor for heart attack and stroke. So if you're losing the vitamin A through stress, then you're going to have a challenge here with the heart because of preoxidation that increases the risk factor for a heart, a heart attack and a stroke. Foods high in vitamin A, sweet potatoes, carrots, squash, butternut it's speaking of here, cantaloupes or melons, dark uh, leafy greens, tropical fruits, sweet red peppers. Did you know there's red peppers, green peppers, orange peppers, yellow peppers? The, the red ones are the most nutritious. Dried apricots, romaine lettuce, all of these are high in vitamin A, B-complex vitamins. What foods are high there? B-complex vitamins are necessary for numerous body processes, including but not limited to energy production and metabolism. Studies show a positive association between or with take intakes of certain B vitamins and health. And I tell you, B vitamins are phenomenal, phenomenal for stress. When people come in to see me, for concerns of stress, it's tough sometimes for me to get them to change their lifestyle, what they're eating, get them to drink more water, get them to um, exercise, get them to trust God, whatever those things are, going to bed early. But I tell you, most people are coming in looking for a healthy pill and probably ranked order, the best thing I can give them to have the best outcome is B vitamins. Give them a B vitamin for breakfast, for dinner, for supper, and that probably has the biggest effect. Yet, I would rather see them change their nutrition, their exercise, modify those eight laws of health. Studies show improved thymine or B1, vitamin B1 uh, status corresponds with improved mood. Niacin, also a member of the B vitamin family, is found to be beneficial for stress-related conditions. Niacin has antioxidant activity and studies corroborate its beneficial effect in lowering high cholesterol and triglyceride levels and protecting against atherosclerosis. Foods high in B1, acorn squash, navy beans, green peas, nuts, dry roasted soybeans, asparagus. Did you know that I was on the way here I met a bunch of kids from Greece. They were coming through the airport. And I thought of this story. In Greece years ago, did you know the average person was not allowed to eat asparagus? They weren't. Only the soldiers could eat asparagus because it had so much nutrition and it prepared the, the, the soldiers to be strong in case there was battle. Only the soldiers got to eat the asparagus because there was so much nutrition in asparagus. Sunflower seeds, foods high in B2, almonds, uh, raw brown uh, uh, Italian mushrooms, uh, sesame seeds, spinach, high in B3, avocados, green peas, peanuts, sunflowers, portobello mushrooms. What about vitamin C? Vitamin C is another powerful antioxidant that scavenges free radicals and protects against some of the harmful effects of stress. I believe taking vitamin C every day is very beneficial for us. Why? If we have plenty of vitamin C, and yes, we can eat our oranges and we can eat our food with vitamin C, and I'd rather see us do that, but not everybody's able to do that. And, and taking that vitamin C or eating that food high in vitamin C protects against some of the harmful effects of stress because it's a powerful antioxidant. 
Studies indicate that cellular levels of vitamin C drop when subjected to stress. Supplementation of vitamin C was found to be beneficial in this case. In a study of 120 males and female subjects, researchers reported that vitamin C, just 3,000 milligrams a day, or three grams, decreased the rise in blood pressure, cortisol, and anxiety that typically accompanied acute psychological stress. So just 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C was very effective in addressing blood pressure rise due to the cortisol increase and the potassium drop. How about vitamin E? In the same research, where vitamin C was reduced by stress, it was found that vitamin E also reduced was also reduced at the cellular levels. Vitamin, C, vitamin E is very important. We talked earlier about the importance of vitamin E. Minerals, magnesium, calcium, zinc, potassium, lithium, magnesium. When we're stressed, cortisol goes up, adrenaline goes up. And when adrenaline goes up, that can help us getting ready for fight or flight, but the effects of adrenaline are very damaging to the cells by itself. So the body has a fire extinguishing system that God put in there, and the fire extinguishing agent is what? Magnesium. Well, what happens is when you're stressed all day long, you're being chased by the bear all day long, you've got that chronic stress, the fire extinguisher is going off all day. It's kind of like the hood system in the kitchen. The agent is magnesium. Are you surprised that we're told 85 to 87 percent of Americans are deficient in magnesium? Magnesium is, a, is an essential mineral, especially during stress. Magnesium is often referred to as the anti-stress mineral. During the stress response, Cortisol and adrenaline release, just is what we we're talking about. The body simultaneously releases magnesium to offset the jarring effect of adrenaline. This is when the fire extinguisher goes off. Chronic stress can induce a vicious cycle of magnesium deficiency because you're dumping that extinguishing agent all day long. And if you're not eating enough magnesium in your diet, then you're going to, it's just, it's what's coming in and going out. It's what's the net. Magnesium deficiencies are also seen in patients with stress-related conditions of diabetes and hypertension. Mildred Selig, in her study, she found middle-aged patients with hypertension who had low blood levels of magnesium had a blood pressure lowering response to three months of magnesium supplementation. Calcium. Calcium is an electrolyte. Calcium performs a number of crucial biological functions, including muscle contractions, nerve conductions, glandular, glandular secretions, energy production, and maintenance of the immune system. What happens with calcium and stress? Calcium has been shown to have an effect on the reduced, reduction of systolic blood pressure with persons diagnosed with hypertension. So where's your calcium? Is it high? Is it where it should be? Is stress wiping you out? In addition, supplementary intakes of calcium have been associated with significantly reducing patients' risks of stroke. Now I warn you, if you're taking supplementation of calcium, say the doc puts you on 1,000 milligrams or 1,200 milligrams, you've got to take magnesium with that because it takes a two to one ratio, two parts calcium, half of that in magnesium to break down the calcium. And if you just take the calcium, you're gonna make your body even lower in magnesium because it's gonna take it from your stores. Zinc, zinc levels decline rapidly following injury or physical stress. And zinc is also rapidly lost in the urine following acute and chronic stress. What do we need zinc for? Very, very important for our immune system. Potassium. 
When the body is stressed, potassium is quickly excreted from the body. Remember we said, when you have stress, cortisol goes up, potassium goes down. Important for the transmission of nerve impulses and the contraction of cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle, there is much evidence indicating that a low intake of potassium can be an important contributor to what? Hypertension. Accumulating evidence suggests that a diet rich in potassium may be protective not only against hypertension, but also against strokes and cardiovascular disease. What's a good source of potassium? Blackstrap molasses, tablespoon twice a day. Or maybe coconut water. Coconut water is very, very high in potassium. Excellent source of potassium. Lithium. Lithium, a trace element, has been found to be beneficial and effective on human behavior in very small quantities. Now most of us are, are familiar with the drug lithium, which is not the best thing. But lithium, like lithium aspartate, or better yet, lithium orotate, it's a mineral that's in the soil. And when folks have stress, I have found it, many folks have found it to be very effective in helping you to address stress. Because stress lowers your lithium level, and when you supplement and take that lithium, then it helps you with dealing with stressors. I personally like lithium orotate. It works very good for stress, anxiety, very good for depression, bipolar, very, very good. Also, it can help with ADD and ADHD. How about herbs? What, do, what impact do herbs have on addressing issues of stress and anxiety? Siberian ginseng, valerian root, wood betony, chamomile, hops, skullcap. Let's, let's take a look. Siberian ginseng. Siberian ginseng has long been used as an anti-stress herb. You know, the folks in my part of the United States, down in the Appalachia, we actually have the best ginseng, I believe, in the world. It's super powerful, and folks will chew on it. It's good for stress. It's good for energy. It has been demonstrated as an anti-fatigue, anti-stress, immuno-enhancing, and, and anti-depressive effects. Valerian root. Valerian is a well-known herbal calmative, uh, antispasmodic, nerve tonic, used for uh, uh, hypochondria, uh, nerve, nervous headaches, irritability, mild spasmodic uh, effects, depression, and insomnia. Folks will make a tea out of it, or they'll take an extract, or they'll take it by capsules. It's very calming. Studies have found that valerian works best as a sleep aid over a period of months rather than in a single dose. And we find that pretty, pretty accurate, that some, some folks it works right off, but some they have to have a buildup with the valerian. Wood betony has traditionally been used to treat anxiety and neuralgia, acts as a tranquilizer, and contains uh, glycosides that have hypertensive characteristics. Chamomile has a sedative effect. It's a great tea. If you like a calming tea, it tastes good, and it helps folks calm down as the day is over. On these herbs and stress, you want to be careful with valerian, skullcap, hops, passionflower. Some of those, they will they'll make you sleepy. And so you don't want to use that during, during the daytime. Hops has a sedative effect. Skullcap. Skullcap has a sedative and antispasmodic effect. Skullcap has also been used for nervous tension. Today, most individuals lead chronically stressed lives without a sufficient intake of essential minerals and vitamins to compensate for their body's increased need. Many are very vulnerable to the damaging physical effects of stress. 
when we look at that, why are we, why is the, is the uh, food deficient? It could be because of erosion of the soil. It can be because the seeds are, are hybrid and they're not the open pollinated seeds, so you're not uptaking those, those nutrients. I was in a seminar up in New York one time, and a person was explaining what happens with using hybrid seed versus the open pollen or heirloom, heirloom seeds. And they explain that cobalt is not taken up through the hybrid seeds. And one of the physicians stood up and said, that's it. We've been trying to figure out why the human brain is more prone to stress, anxiety, depression, be, because it is deficient in cobalt. She said that makes sense. Because most of our food today come from hybrid seeds, and the hybrid seeds don't allow or don't uptake the cobalt like it should. So as we look at our food, a controllable, choose what you pick. Are you picking foods that's just fast and quick, that's refined, and maybe from a hybrid source, that may be grown in nutrition, uh, soil that's not nutritious? The best garden, the best nutrients come from your backyard. Let's look at exercise. Exercise is a form of physical stress. Can physical stress relieve mental stress? Alexander Pope, thought so. Strength through mind is exercise, not rest. Plato agreed. Exercise would cure a guilty conscience. You'll think so too. If you learn to apply the physical stress of exercise in a controlled, graded fashion, exercise. So what's the best way to exercise? I find intermittent or interval training where you exercise and then go slow. Exercise then go slow. Very, very effective as you um, address the issues of stress. But walking, running, cycling, rowing, whatever it may be, rebounding, but exercise is critical in lowering stress. The mental benefits of aerobic exercise have a neuro neurochemical uh, basis. Exercise reduces levels of body stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. It also stimulates the production of endorphins, chemicals in the brain that, the bodies, that are the body's natural painkillers and mood elevators. Endorphins are responsible for the runner's high and for the, and for the feelings of relaxation and optimism that accompany many hard workouts. Exercise in almost any form can act as a stress reliever. Virtually any form of exercise, from aerobics to walking, can act as a stress reliever. If you're not an athlete, or even if you're out of shape, you can still make a little exercise go a long way towards stress management. Discover the connection between exercise and stress relief, and why exercise should be a part of your stress management. It pumps up your endorphins. It, uh, uh, it's med meditation in motion. It improves your mood. Exercise is amazing. And, the, and if you want really good exercise, go outside in the fresh air and in the sunshine, sunshine so you're actually getting three benefits all in one. Water. If you're looking for a simple way to unwind from stress filled life, try this. Drink a glass of water. It's really true. It's amazing what a fresh glass of water can do for stress. Just one glass. Studies have shown that being just half a liter dehydrated can increase your cortisol level. Did you get that? Just a half a liter dehydrated, that's a pint. Now, how much water do we need? If we're a kindergartner, we need how much water? A half a gallon a day. From a kindergartner to, kindergartner to 128 pounds, a half a gallon. Over 128 pounds, your body weight divided by two, that many ounces of water. If you're, not, if you're a pint low, here's what it can happen. Studies have shown that being just a half a liter, a pint dehydrator, dehydrated, can increase your cortisol levels. Cortisol is one of these stress hormones. Staying in a good hydrated status can keep your stress levels down. When you don't 
give your body the fluids it needs, you're putting stress on it, and it's going to respond to that. So just drinking water is amazing in addressing your stress. Stress can cause dehydration, and dehydration can cause stress. It is a vicious cycle. You can break it by building more water consumption into your day. Stress can result in many of the same responses as increased heart rate, nausea, fatigue, headaches, etc. So if you can remain hydrated, you can reduce the magnitude of the physiological responses we have to stress. So it's not just for stress. Cardiologists now tell us, first thing in the morning, drink water. We gotta thin, those, thin the blood. It, one cardiologist told me, he says, the best blood thinner in the world is water. And before going to bed, cardiologists now say, drink water. Be careful, you don't wanna stay up all night having to go to the bathroom, but drink enough that will work to do both. <clears throat> Sunshine. As ultraviolet light from the sun enters the eye, it stimulates the pineal gland to convert tryptophan into serotonin. Adequate levels of serotonin assist with stress management. But did you know if you're wearing sunglasses, that won't work. There was an army in Africa. And this army, they changed the uniform policy where all of the soldiers, when they were outside, had to wear sunglasses. They then found that these soldiers started getting SAD. You've heard of SAD, that seasonal disorder up in Alaska and up north? They were in Africa. How do Africans get SAD? They've got plenty of sunshine. It's because of the sunglasses. They took the sunglasses off, the SAD went away. So yes, we may not, if we work outside, we don't want to have to wear sunglasses. I mean, we don't, have to be, we don't want to have to be out in the sun all day without sunglasses. It can be beneficial. But we need some time during the day that we don't have sunglasses on. Temperance is making the right choices in our day-to-day -day lives. It's moderation in the good things and total abstinence in the bad things. I used to think that it was okay to have moderation in all things until Walter got old enough and I said, wait a minute, moderation in cocaine is not an option in my family. It's moderation in the good stuff and total abstinence in the bad stuff. So what do we want to abstain from? Tobacco, alcohol, illicit drugs. How about what we listen to? How about what we read and watch? We want total abstinence in those guys. That can affect your stress. Pure fresh air. Researchers at Harvard School of Public Health recently studied the effects of fine particles, black carbon, nitrogen dioxide, and other pollutants on stress. They analyzed data in 987 men and found perceptive level, or perceived levels of stress rise when people are exposed to air pollution. I believe that. The association was especially evident in cooler weather or colder weather and in relation to overall particle count levels. Although the researchers noted that the exact mechanism by which air pollution and stress are related uh, remains a mystery, they think that brain inflammation and hormonal activity are involved in the connection between pollution and stress. Stress increases the effects of pollution and pollution increases stress. It only makes sense to reduce one's exposure to air pollution whenever possible. You know, it's interesting as we look at how the body works. We've got the body over here, trillions of cells. We've got the blood, and then the quality of the blood determines the quality of the cells. And if we're breathing in air that has pollution, it's gonna go into our blood, and then from the blood, it's gonna go into our brain and every cell in our body. Rest. Sleep is a necessary human function. It allows our brain to recharge and our bodies to reset or to rest. When we do not sleep long or well enough, our bodies do not get the full benefits of sleep, such as muscle repair, memory consideration, consolidation. Sleep is so crucial that even sleep Slight sleep deprivation or poor sleep can affect memory, judgment, and mood. Research has shown that most Americans would be happier 
healthier, and safer if they were, if they were to sleep an extra 60 to 90 minutes per night. And we definitely find that so. Again, the hours before midnight are worth twice the hours after midnight. A good night's sleep makes you able to tackle the day's stress more easily. When you are tired, you are less patient and more easily agitated, which can increase stress. Most adults need nine, seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Do you find that? Do you find when you didn't get adequate sleep that your nerves are a little more on edge? You're not as patient? Absolutely. Trust in divine power. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. The religion of Christ, so far from being the cause of insanity, is one of its most effectual remedies, for it is a potent soother to the nerves. What's a potent soother to the nerves? The religion of Christ. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, I give it unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isn't that calming? Isn't that give you hope? This earth's becoming crazy, y'all. The stresses of the economy, the stresses of politics. Is there hope? Absolutely. But only through Christ. Come with Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Key points to remember as we conclude. Stress is natural, normal, and necessary in moderation. There's no way that we can totally get rid of stress because stress is out there. We live in a sin-sick world. We live in a world that's at war. There's a war out there between good and evil, and you and I are caught up in it. How we respond to it, how our brains respond to those stressors, what are our reactions, depends on what? How we take care of our body. Are we doing those controllables? Are we trusting in God? Are we giving it to Him? Stress can build up and put you at risk for serious health problems. Don't try to eliminate all stress because it's not, that's just not accessible. Stre excess stress can negatively affect both physical and mental health. We saw that We need to learn healthy adaptations, maintain a healthy lifestyle, including good nutrition and exercise, commitment to an honorable cause that helps others and is approved by God. You know, it's, it really makes a difference if what you do, whether your occupation or your ministry or your hobby, is it something that's honorable? Is it something that's helping other folks? I remember my dad told me, he says, don't just take from the community, give back. Give back to those in need, whether you're, you're volunteering at the animal shelter or you're, or you're helping with feeding the poor, you know, the homeless or whatever it might be. Helping your local church is going in, in health outreach. But that can make a huge difference on your level of stress. Proper planning and organization. When people plan, when people are organized, there's much less stress. God is an organized God. God is a God of order. And if we pre-plan our day, if we pre-plan our week, if we pre-plan our month, and if we pre-plan our year, Yes, as we go out, there's less that we're planning, but there's things that are goals that we're looking forward to. Have you ever asked someone, what are you doing tomorrow? I don't know. What's your, what's your goals in life? I don't know. I'll just come go day by day. Well, that person can really become stressed. 
So as we look at planning, we've got to look at what our ultimate goal is. And I encourage that you have an ultimate goal of going to heaven, spending eternity with Christ. Now, how do you get to that ultimate goal? You build from there. Coca-Cola, or Coca-Cola as we call it, Coca-Cola does a 25-year plan every year. The board of directors come together and they decide where are we going to be in 25 years? Well, they first look at their mission. What is Coca-Cola's mission? Okay, now where do we want to be in 25 years? Now, if what they want to be in 25 years is different than their mission, they either have to change their mission or they have to change what they want to do in 25 years as a goal. Once those two are aligned, then they make their 10-year, 5-year, 3, 2, 1-year plan. So I encourage you to make a plan. What is your ultimate goal? And how do you want to get there? And then what you're doing this year, this month, and today are building towards that goal. If you're out there just flying in the breeze, you're going to have stress, y'all. Proper planning and organization. Dwell on the good. It is a law of the mind that it adapts itself upon the things of which it is trained to dwell. So what are you training your brain to think on? Are you thinking on crazy stuff or are you thinking on godly stuff? Dwell on the good. Are you always looking at the bad? Are you always looking at, boy, poor me, look what happened to me. Nobody likes me. I always get the shaft. I always get this. I always get that. Then you're probably going to feel that way. Are you looking towards the good? Focus on the good and it will make a whole new life for you. Meditate on Christ. And don't be anxious about tomorrow. But the most important I want to leave with you. As you look at stress... Trust in God, because that is where the power is. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that we're in a war between good and evil. We're slap dab in the middle. And Lord, we ask that you will take our hand. We ask that we'll have a desire to raise our hand for you to take our hand and lead us through this, this battlefield. Show us where the minefields are. Show us what you'd have us to do. Give us that ability to change our lifestyles. To be able to take hold and, and apply those controllables that will make a whole different impact on our physiological situation. And Lord, we ask as we go through the travail that you will give us that power to hang on to you as we go over each hill, each mogul, as it gets bigger and bigger, preparing us for a time to come as never before. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.